You've seen it in the background. It's played a supporting role in some of my videos, my Chickering and Sons Concert Grand. In this video, I'll introduce you to my most loyal musical partner and describe how I brought this piano to peak performance, including by making some modifications to the original design. Hi, I'm Ben Blozan. Some of you may know that I run a recording studio called Gate City Studios in Greensboro, North Carolina. This studio caters to classical and jazz musicians, so the success of the studio is very much tied to the quality of the piano I have. In fact, in the early years of the studio, I concluded that in order to level up, I really needed a much better instrument than the one I had at the time. Enter a Chickering Concert Grand from the mid-1920s. A friend alerted me that it was being sold online for $9,000, which appealed to me since equipment purchases and studio renovations hadn't left me with much budget. It belonged to a musician in LA, which meant unless I was willing to fly to California, I would have to buy the piano sight unseen. Super risky, right? Well, the piano was being brokered by Dale Irwin, a name you probably know if you're in the biz, but for those of you who don't know, he's a super well-respected piano rebuilder and technician. I had a phone conversation with him in which he was honest about the fact that the piano needed a good deal of refinement, but that nothing really major was wrong with the instrument. Given my willingness to invest plenty of sweat equity, I thought it might be a golden opportunity to greatly improve my studio's piano. So I pulled the trigger. It took several months of painful anticipation, but finally my chickering arrived and I could play my first note on it. The soundboard, despite being original, had no cracks, but still had crown. The pin block was also original, but the sized up tuning pins were holding fast. I had long known that California is kinder on pianos than the East Coast, but the condition of this 90-year-old instrument really brought that home. On the negative side, the action was a struggle to play. It felt both light and heavy at the same time. I came to find later that the keys had been loaded up with leads to help power the heavy hammers someone had installed. So basically, the keys felt light when played slow because they had so much assist from the key leads, but those same leads created an inertial resistance when you went to play fast passages or trills. I also wanted to see if I could get more beauty and sustain out of the treble. I got to work. So I started with the action and I replaced all of the whippins. I got the kind of whippins that where you can uh, where you glue the heel on yourself, that is the bottom of the of the, the whippin. And um, just to get to get in the ballpark, I used what's called the magic line, where you, you press the, the key half down and you trace a line that goes from where the key meets the balance rail pin. It extends through where the capstan meets the whippin and then concludes at that pin right there that holds the, uh, the, that holds the whippin. So if you get those three in line, uh, you're, you're usually in pretty good shape. I also replaced the hammers and shanks. Um, the, for the hammer heads, I went with Ronson Weikert felt, which has been a favorite of mine uh, for some time and some other technicians that, whose work I admire. They are voice up hammers, which means that they start off soft and then you use hardener to the extent that you like. Uh, to, to get them to come up to the brilliance you need. Um, with the middle, I hardly put any in, um, except for in all the hammers, I hardened the, the lower portion. That gives it a good support to work off of. Uh, and then um, more juice as I went to, to the extremes. When you, when you get that punchy, that punchy um, clear projecting base, and then kind of a, um, a appealingly glassy, uh, if, that, if that works for you, uh, treble, that's usually the result of, of hardening with, uh, with, with lacquer or acetone, other types, of, other types of substances. Oh, let me show you uh, in the keys. Do you see these empty holes? That's where all the lead had been put in. So I removed a lot of lead and it just the, the instantly, the, um, because the hammer size was appropriate, the, the, um, the key weight was appropriate, it just became a lot more agile, a lot more manageable. Um, 
And I, without getting too much into the weeds, I used some techniques uh, developed by a man named David Stanwood to weigh off the action uh, and get a consistent touch weight for, um, you know, across, across the keyboard. Um, so in the end, I was really, I'm really super happy with how the action feels. Um, the word velvety is the way I, I often describe it, and it seems like um, other pianists like it as well. Another early improvement I made was to put GC bass strings on the piano. And that's just almost a standard course of action when I get a new piano or one that I'm fixing up. Bass strings are one of those great bang for your buck improvements that you can do on a piano. And um, amazingly, they, they help the entire piano because there's so much sympathetic vibration that, that goes on in a piano. Uh, so if you have really lively bass strings, that's gonna help even your, your um, treble sing out more. I mentioned that I wanted to improve the sound of the treble. And even after I replaced the hammers, I felt like maybe there was some more improvement that I could make. Um, I noticed that the thickness of the strings on this instrument was thicker than um, Steinways and Baldwin's of that, uh, of the same size. You notice the 14, 14 and a half. Uh, these are sizes that are one size and sometimes two sizes larger than those arrived at by Steinway and Baldwin. And I thought maybe uh, dealing with the string scale uh, would, would help with that. So I talked to a scaling expert named Arno Patin and he cooked up a new scale for, uh, for this piano based on his, his research. And uh, you can see my, these new marks on the plate uh, are that recipe. He also recommended using softer wire made by this company named Palello. Palello is based in France and they, and they create these, these wires that come in packages that look like fine brie. And they have several different hardnesses of string, um, which I think has to do with the carbon uh, content that is, is in the steel. But in any case, uh, Arno suggested that I use Palello O-type wire from the first plane wire all the way up to sort of the beginning of the treble section. It's uh, actually... A right above the staff is the last note that's in the softer Palello O wire. So the thinking is in the part of the piano that has long speaking lengths, modern wire is just too comfortable. It's too far away from its breaking point. Uh, you want it to be somewhere around uh, 50 to 70 percent of its tensile strength and the softer wire brings that area much closer to that, to that point. And so a lot of rebuilders these days are using this wire. Uh, they feel it gets a little more warmth out of this area. Uh, let me play some music that uses this portion of the piano.
so I restrung the piano using his scale. I also did something bold and asked my friend John Johansson, who's the owner of Mosaic Pianos and has been a guest on this show. I had him re-notch a certain portion of the bridge. Once again, I took a cue from Steinway and Baldwin and had John make these speaking lengths much more in accordance with the, uh, the, the lengths that, that those companies uh, arrived at in this section. And this is a crucial section. It's, you know, this F sharp to this E. And, um, you know, it does seem to have improved the sustain and the tone of that area. Once the piano was restrung, I was so much happier with the treble section. I think it amounted to an accumulation of improvements. We had the improved scale uh, in terms of the thickness of the wire and uh, John's improvements with, uh, to the speaking length. And also I just think the, the wire itself was of a higher quality. So the sounds that I loved in the middle of the piano, the warmth, the clarity, extended from there on up to, the, to note 88. By borrowing some specs from Steinway and Baldwin and by using action parts that I could customize myself, I guess it reveals that I wasn't treating this piano as a museum piece. Uh, I wasn't trying to restore it to its original state, uh, but rather see what was the, the, uh, the most beautiful quality that I could get out of it. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Steinway and Baldwin, these companies were a little more rigorous in their research and development. And um, I, did a, I think I did well to nudge this piano in that direction. But that said, Chickering really knew how to give their instruments soul. And playing this instrument is a real treat because it's, it's in that family of the American piano sound. But it's a little different. There's an exotic, kind of captivating quality to it. And despite the changes that I've made, which are not huge, uh, at its heart, it still is a Chickering. So although I continue to refine the voicing of this piano, the main improvements have been done for about a, about a year. And uh, it was a big relief how it turned out. Uh, you know, I was able to, at the fraction of a cost of what most concert grands go for, I feel like I have a sound that's kind of in the neighborhood of those, of those pianos. You know, pia we're talking pianos that would cost, you know, 60 to 150,000. And, um, you know, for maybe like 13,000 and a lot of work, um, I've, I've got a piano that makes some really, really classy sounds. And so it's just been so gratifying to see how pianists take to the instrument when they come in for a session. Sometimes it only takes a few seconds. Uh, one, one pianist just played a little bit. She said, oh, the, the voicing, it just obeys, which you know, as a piano technician, just thrilled me. Uh, Francesco Torisi, who's the musical partner of Rhiannon Giddens, really wonderful pianist from Italy, uh, compared it favorably to a, a Fazioli that he recently played on tour. Uh, I think in many ways this piano is a testament to what one can do with an old instrument, sometimes not even taking a traditional purist approach. I mean, I altered the scaling, uh, including the length of the notes. And um, if I keep this piano for a long time, I, there are some other, other changes that I might make to it. In avoiding kind of a purist approach, I feel like I was able to, to squeeze a little more uh, sound quality out of this instrument. In case you want to hear the chickering a little bit more, I have included uh, the most recent solo piano recording I've made. It's with pianist Daniel Zayfried, and he played a Ravel piece that really explores and exploits the, uh, the piano's capabilities quite effectively. Uh, as always, if you are enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. I appreciate it. <laughs>